Hi there. I am Ian Littman, and as he said, we're going to talk about web scraping today. Um, this is the other of the uh, two topics that submitted here, uh, and it's like, well, th this is what I do in my day job, so uh, it shouldn't be uh, too terribly difficult to put together a presentation that actually um, you know, get, gets into the uh, gritty details of how to do this a bit better, because a lot of um, what we do at uh, Covey is um, web scraping, because the uh, insurance industry in the U.S. is just about as bad as the banking industry in the U.S. for being behind the times, so you get uh, the data and turn it into APIs any way you can. Um, interestingly enough, things have gotten maybe a little bit better. Things have gone from uh, server-side rendered HTML to um, everybody's uh, favorite uh, single-page applications, usually in Angular in their case. But um, still requires some level of expertise to get that data out into a consistent format. And uh, we'll talk through some of those learnings both from that work as well as some stuff that I've done in the past here today. If you want to follow along with these slides or see them afterwards, ian.im slash scrape uk22 will get you there. So what we're going to cover today, um, we're going to cover tools, we're going to cover principles, we're going to cover a couple of demos, including how to pull things from directly from server-side rendered stuff, single page applications, PDFs to some extent, Excel documents, et cetera, because you never know when the, uh, you might come across some data that's not in the format that you might expect. Um, again, we will have some demos of doing this in PHP, and we'll also point out a couple of cases where doing things purely in PHP will not be the most effective way to uh, get the data. We'll go over what tools you would use instead. Um, and uh, kind of some, some pitfalls and workarounds that you may need along the way. So, first off, what you're trying to do when you're scraping sites is getting data out of them. What that data is usually in the form of is maybe that's JSON, <coughs> excuse me, JSON, maybe some XML, usually not, HTML, maybe some JavaScript object somewhere, sometimes a PDF. Um, usually these things are delivered over standard HTTP, although uh, one of the more interesting uh, things that I've seen more recently is working over uh, WebSockets, potentially with a non-standard message payload, and well, that's a bit more fun, and we're actually still working through that on our side. But in most cases, you're dealing with HTTP requests back and forth. One of those requests, or multiple of them, contain as a response the data that you actually need. So you're going to need to get to the point where you can make the correct response request with the correct state to get the correct response, to get the data that you're looking for. As such, you're going to probably want to work backwards from the data that you want to the request that you made to get that data to the request that you needed to make to make the request that you need to make to get that data. Setting cookies and session state and such along the way. The alternative is, <coughs> well, going through to start with trying to pull absolutely everything and uh, that's a surefire way to pull a lot more data than you need, take a lot more time than you need, and have a more brittle integration than you need. So yes, it means that you have to work through the process forwards and then backwards in order to get the exact data that you need, but it's useful to take the time to do that. Um, along the way, you're going to need to make various requests, and that those requests will include some sort of data. Maybe that's user-provided data. Maybe you're logging into a service on behalf of a user. In some cases, there are calculated values in those requests, maybe browser fingerprints, maybe um, nonces, maybe uh, state values. It kind of depends on what stage of the process you're at. In those cases, you might have to 
uh, generate that data on your own, potentially by reverse engineering somebody's JavaScript library to understand how they're generating the data. Or you get the data from the end user, or you realize, wait a minute, this data, this particular field is hard-coded 100% of the time, so I can hard-code it on my side as well. So at each step, you'll need to figure out, okay, what data do I need to make this request, make the request, pull the data from the response to make the next request. A lot of that's cookies, some of it isn't. So, the other decision that you're, one of the decisions that you're going to need to make relatively early on on this is, well, do I need to use a full headless browser or can I do this entire process within something that just pushes HTTP requests across the wire? And the answer is, well, in most cases, at least from what we've seen, you don't need the headless browser. Yes, it may be a little bit easier to build the integration out that way. However, headless browsing is a bit performance intensive. Uh, by my benchmarks, uh, running headless Chrome is about uh, 250 meg of RAM to start with, plus another uh, 100 meg of RAM per additional tap. In addition to that, you're actually executing JavaScript, which uh, takes CPU cycles. If you're trying to do this uh, one-off, then maybe that doesn't matter. If you're trying to do this at scale, on the other hand, then every CPU cycle or every billion CPU cycles at least matters. So you don't want to fire up a headless web browser if you don't have to. Now, that's the disadvantage of running in a headless browser. The advantage is you can easily execute JavaScript, um, and that's rather handy for uh, certain cases where it's not immediately obvious how you get the request payload to make that initial um, request back to the server and get the correct response. So what we've done internally is we've taken a headless browser, uh, Chromium, bundled it up with a tool called Puppeteer to uh, interact it with it via JS, taken that, uh, wrapped it in a node uh, web service, and our PHP code just calls that when we need to do some headless browsing, rather than trying to throw that in the same container as the rest of our application. So main application here, headless browser service over here, interacting over HTTP, we might move this over to Lambda at some point, but it's, it becomes somewhat irrelevant as an implementation detail versus the rest of the application, and that's kind of where you want to be. Now, getting back to the PHP side of things, because that is what we'll be demoing today. The nice thing about the PHP side of things is, well, the uh, HTTP client side and your, um, your actual DOM traversal side, there are libraries for that that are pretty well developed. And if you're used to writing PHP, then um, you'll have a reasonable amount of luck working through those libraries. The ones that we use internally are Symfony HTTP browser in cases where we need to uh, traverse the DOM and actually pull some server-side rendered HTML stuff uh, uh, out of it. And uh, Guzzle, actually, just the plain old HTTP client, in cases where uh, the target of our scraping has switched to a um, single page app or the like, where we don't actually need to look at HTML all the time. The nice thing about Guzzle is you can do requests in parallel via uh, their asynchronous stuff. Uh, the nice thing about HTTP browser is by default, it, it's going to catch things like referrer and cookies and forms and general HTML parsing. So you kind of trade off between the two depending on, uh, on the job that, that you're looking at. Of course, if you don't want to use Guzzle at all, you can use the uh, Symfony HTTP client, but in our case, we use Guzzle. So, nice thing about the PHP side of things is it's rather resource light. It's just a script. You're pulling HTTP requests in, dealing with responses, and moving on. And again, it's working with the code that you're used to, but you're not going to be executing arbitrary JavaScript inside a PHP runtime, at least not without um, too heavy of a lift, like don't, don't bother, just use a headless browser. Um, so kind of that's your trade-off. My, um, my personal approach to this is 
take the extra bit of effort to see if you can replay requests rather than browser interactions. It'll pay for itself in potentially more reliable and definitely faster and lower resource consumption uh, script executions. But again, in certain cases, we have to go out to the headless browser, um, and that's absolutely fine. Just make sure that that's uh, kind of the last uh, ditch effort there. So, as part of this, you're going to want to make sure that you're dealing with as many edge cases in your script as possible. Because it's almost as if you're writing an integration test against some external system. Now, the difference is that you can assert the type of data that comes out, but not necessarily the data itself, because if you were able to assert the data itself, then why would you be scraping it? So with this, we'll see this in an example uh, shortly, but you want to make sure that, for example, if you're logging into something, you want to test with both successful and failed logins. If you're dealing with multi-factor authentication, proxying that over, you want to test uh, between actually having uh, the correct MFA code and not. You want to see what those responses are coming back so that you can properly understand um, where to kind of fall back, what exceptions are expected. Because some of these services, you might say, oh, well, if I write this all the way through and just use Guzzle, it's going to give me a 400-tier response if there's uh, incorrect data or something like that. No, 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 people don't know how to write APIs or, or web pages in the year 2022. Some of them will return a 200 OK with an error message, and you need to be able to understand that somewhere on that page is going to tell you what the error message is, not necessarily in the status code. So one tool that is the first thing that I reach for in, in kind of reverse engineering these sites to scrape is Firefox. The reason I reach for Firefox rather than Chrome, although Chrome has gotten better about this, is that I have seen in a few cases that Chrome will just skip requests and responses. It, they, they won't show the request payload, they won't show the response payload um, in the network view. And then you're, you're sitting there wondering, I, I know I'm missing something. My scraper code isn't working, and I don't know why. In Firefox's case, that tends to be a bit more reliable. In addition, there are uh, ways to edit and replay requests within Firefox that Chrome doesn't have. That, with that said, Chrome has gotten better about this. They have actually split the request uh, payload into its own tab rather than tacking it at the very end of the uh, headers tab, which was rather annoying. Um, but uh, just kind of as a, a force of habit, I'll still reach for Firefox first. And I would say the, the only exception to that is if I'm trying to reverse engineer uh, JavaScript stuff, in which case Chrome's tooling is slightly better for that. Um, so I would say you, you're going to wind up bouncing between both. Another kind of interesting thing about Firefox versus Chrome is that Firefox is a little bit easier to pretend you are Firefox when you really aren't. Um, this comes in. Uh, handy, I'll, I'll mention this later in the presentation. But uh, Firefox, uh, th there are certain frameworks that are trying to fingerprint the browser and say, okay, are you a real browser or not? And in those cases, they will do various benchmarks using the Performance Timing JS API. Those benchmarks are at high resolution in Chrome, whereas in Firefox, as well as in, for example, Node.js, uh, those are at lower resolution, basically millisecond resolution rather than uh, microsecond, which means that it's easier to, to create believable numbers for those benchmarks, even if you're not run, running a single line of JavaScript, if you're emulating Firefox rather than if you're emulating Chrome. And yes, that means that Firefox is still, even after uh, the latest changes and such, um, leaking less information than Chrome is um, to anybody who might be interested in that. So, now it's demo time. The first uh, of our two demos is going to be something that I've been rather interested in for a while, which is, well, telephone networks. So in the US, we have a whole ton of different uh, smaller telephone companies. Not all of them have merged into AT&T quite yet. And um, you know, we have this 
consistent uh, area code prefix and then um, last four uh, phone numbers set up. Well, each of those phone numbers is assigned uh, to, to a city at a um, area code prefix and block level usually. And you know, it may be useful to understand, okay, well, given this phone number, assuming they haven't ported it from one carrier to another, what is the underlying provider? Are they some voice over inter internet provider? Are they mobile? Are they one of uh, these landline providers that have still like five people using a hardline phone? Um, so there's a site to uh, look up this information called Local Calling Guide. And it's actually a PHP site. Uh, there's .php in the URLs. And it's all server-side rendered. It's moderately simple to scrape, um, although it could be easier. There could be a few, landmark, a few more landmarks on the HTML, and it is all server-side rendered HTML. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at a couple of examples there where I'm trying to get basically the information that they show in a table into a format that I may be able to use uh, elsewhere, including kind of column headers and such. Um, all of the code for this is on my uh, personal GitHub, github.com slash ensltx. I also have it linked directly here in slides. If you go to my GitHub profile, it is the uh, only pinned repo right now. So let's hop over here. So this is the local calling guide screen. And what we'll do is we will look by rate center. And let's say a rate center of Austin, Texas. Let's search. All right, so we've got something here. That's all good. Um, let's click through here. And then we have prefix detail. And then we have this big table here that um, if we zoom out, you'll notice is a standard table. It's just a bit of CSS swapping things around. And we have 95 pages of results because Austin is um, not a small city. So um, in this case, um, looked through this earlier on and determined that um, there's not a whole lot of detail in uh, these HTML elements, which I'll show you in just a second. So one thing that unfortunately due to uh, projector sizing, it's a little bit difficult to see up here, is we have uh, kind of an exchange ID parameter there, and that's all fine. Um, interestingly enough, that same exchange ID parameter is here which means, in this case, we want to be as efficient as possible, and we realize, wait a minute, we can, anything that gets us to this page here, we could actually skip and go all the way over to the uh, prefix detail page and um, you know, save another web request there and save a little bit of DOM traversal there. So, we've got our query here, go to this page here, but th basically the fun part here is trying to figure out how to parse this HTML. So we'll hop over to here. And unfortunately that's about as big as I can get it. Let's look at one of these elements. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of uh, semantic detail in these elements. So what we're going to likely have to do here is, um, is grab you know, everything in this link list here and then see, hey, is this a number? Is this a number? Is this a number? If it's not a number, then skip it. If it is a number, figure out which page we're on and go to the next one. Now. Remember what I said about edge cases. 
yes, this one has multiple pages. However, if we, let's go all the way back to the home page here. Let's go to a much smaller city. Click here. Click through here. Prefix detail. And we'll notice that this one only has a single page of results. Again, edge cases. We're going to need to make sure that our scraping utility can deal with cases that have both one page of results and more than one. Fortunately, we know what use cases to, to throw in, what, um, uh, what effectively tests to try, so we can work through there. So, for the sake of brevity, I did already write this code out, make sure that it worked, so we don't spend the next uh, significant amount of time trying to figure out how to uh, work through this. So, let's hop over to here. There we go. To see the code. So, uh, we're just doing command line inputs. Actually, this is, yep. Uh, we're doing command line input for uh, these items. Nice and easy. First thing that we request is um, this list bit here. And in this case, I believe they have a CSRF token. Um, so we actually have to pull that home page in first before we can submit our search. That CRSF, CRSF, yeah, CSRF token is part of the form. So that's really all we need to do there because Symphony HTTP browser does uh, and DOM crawler does the extra work for us. Grab that form, super descriptively named there. And um, and then submit our data of city and, well, in the US, it's state. Make that request, get the response back, and um, either we get a rate center um, back somewhere on that page, or we don't. Uh, we'll just grab the first one there. And if we don't, then we error out because that's we just ask for a city that doesn't exist. At this point, the next thing we need to do is we need to actually go to that prefix detail page. There are a couple ways to do this, but as I pointed out earlier, you've got a um, you've got kind of a shortcut in here where we've seen that the URL for the prefix detail page is the same as the URL for um, for the page before it, just with a different file name. The same prefix query parameter is used on both. So instead of <coughs> loading a page, parsing through it, and then, um, and then loading the next page, we use something simpler, which is replacing the URL of the existing request with a slightly different file name, and then requesting that, and then we get to the same place. So call through there, and since it appears that local calling guide hasn't been updated significantly, and well, since not using a front controller was a normal way of writing PHP, then um, we're reasonably um, satisfied with the idea of taking shortcuts like this. Now, if you're looking at something else, you, you will eventually get a feel for what things are likely to change and what things are likely to stay the same as websites go, under, uh, go into revisions. And you'll have to keep that in mind when scraping because these APIs or the APIs that you're effectively relying on can and will move out from under you. So in this case, we get um, we have this table here. And we'll notice that um, while Symphony has this DOM crawler um, primitive built in, which is kind of nice. If you for each, <coughs> if you for each over it, then it turns turns into a DOM node, which 
is a little bit more annoying to work with. Yes, you can rewrap it, but um, it kind of wasn't worth the effort in some of these cases. But in this case, we're still using the Symphony DOM crawler objects for this, so you can do a nice uh, CSS-based filter here, grab the text out of it, and continue with your life. With that said, we've got this uh, pagination thing going on here. We need to actually go through every single page and say, hey, do, do we have anything else here? If we don't have any pages, then we're good to go. If we do, we need to find the end page and then keep on iterating through until we've grabbed everything. So that's what this script does. Let's actually see if it works. It's going to take a second here because, as I mentioned, Symphony HTTP Browser doesn't really do async stuff. So instead of hitting this stuff in parallel and potentially getting a 502 because uh, FPM ran out of workers, um, we're going page by page. And there's our list. So that's off to a good start here. And likewise, let's check our edge case. That was a lot quicker because we only had one page results. And let's see what happens when we have an exception, as expected. So looks like our local calling guide parser is doing what it's supposed to do. And we successfully turned uh, what I'm sure was rows in a database somewhere that got turned into HTML back into something that you could throw right back into a database. So. With that, let's go to our next demo. This is a little bit closer to what I do in my day job. Um, so we, we pull in insurance details in order to kind of provide them upstream. For example, if a property manager is saying, hey, I want proof of insurance before letting uh, you rent uh, this flat. Um, in those cases, what we do is we provide the opportunity for uh, an end user to log in, we promise we're not phishing them, um, to their insurance carrier. We pull the requisite information, make sure that it is in a consistent uh, API format, and then hand it off downstream via webhook or JS callback. Um, one such insurance carrier, although they're more, more on the homeowner side rather than the renter side, is Hippo. They're a bit newer, so they actually have a single page application with um, auth zero for auth. And so I want to get my own information here. So let's hop back over to Firefox and see what theirs looks like. One thing that you may forget to do is preserve logs in the network pane on Firefox. Fortunately, I have that checkbox checked, so I don't have to redo any of this stuff. So let's do a hard refresh of this page to see what requests come across. All right, so we've got an XHR here. Let's see what this is. OK, so that's doesn't seem terribly useful. Configuration. There's some more config there. I think we don't need that to log in. All right. So, so far, I think we don't need any information from this request, so we'll just clear that out. So, I'll hit that. All right, it sent me a text message. Okay, at this point, we've seen two requests come across. This is, okay, that's an options, so that's just cores, pre-flight. 
don't need that because we'll be operating server to server. And then we have this request here. We have a few items in there that I'll point out on the uh, code that actually makes this thing run. And then we get a response with some initial state. So far, so good. Let's go ahead and fill in the uh, code here. And for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to do the edge case of filling in the incorrect code or filling in a phone number that doesn't exist. I do handle those in the code that we'll see in a minute. So that was the uh, passwordless login process, um, and I got information there. Yes, that's real address. You can look it up on tax records, so it's not terribly secret. Um, so we have a couple more requests here. So we do a request. So what we're looking for here is this. Okay, that's XHR and CSS. Let's close that out. So this is the policies endpoint. So basically, at this point here, we see information on the policy. So we know that everything after this request, we don't really need because we've already got the information that we're looking for. So we scroll back up. Configuration policies, policies, verify. That looks like what we want. And it's a get. So that gets us a response, that gets us a 200. Might actually need that. And then, ah, here we go. We've got this authenticate request here. I'll bet this one has the uh, OTP code in it. Oh, there, there we go, it does. And we get uh, some sort of response back. Probably need that. And I'll bet it's gonna be a get request somewhere in order to, okay, user info, request there. And at this point, because we're dealing with Auth0, we're, we've got some headers in here, so we've got an uh, opaque token there saying, okay, if you pass these headers, you pass in a, uh, uh, or a uh, Auth0 uh, client ID and such. Um, basically, if you're looking at some of these uh, single page applications, you're going to be looking a lot more at headers potentially some JSON payloads and requests and then response than you would otherwise. If somebody sets headers on responses, you might need to pay attention to them because you might need to provide those same headers back in a subsequent request. And unlike with cookies, those headers are not going to be set by default, even if you have a cookie jar enabled on your HTTP client. Symphony HTTP browser has that by default. Guzzle does not. However, if you pass in uh, cookies, arrow true uh, in the uh, constructor there, just as an array parameter uh, on config, then it will set you up a cookie jar um, and share those between requests. So at this point, we've kind of looked at a surface level through here and noticed what kind of requests we need. Again, I took probably three or four hours a while back to actually fully reverse engineer this, so I will walk you through the code that uh, came out of that reverse engineering expedition rather than trying to do it on the fly. Because these things, in order to figure out which things are consistent, which things are just kind of made up, which things are hard-coded, takes a little bit of experimentation, and that's fine. So, hop over to GitHub. Go here. So, in this case, we are starting off with uh, Guzzle rather than uh, Symfony HTTP browser. And <coughs> through looking through the 
uh, requests and knowing a little bit about how um, OAuth tends to work, figured out that we have a couple of headers that are actually static through this uh, process. One is on the Auth0 side and one is elsewhere. Also, anytime you see that EY whatever uh, in some sort of payload, that is a telltale sign that that is uh, Base64 encoded JSON. So if you see that, maybe it's a JWT, maybe it's something else, you probably want to th run that through Base64 decode and see if there's anything interested, interesting in it. Um, got a couple more headers in here as defaults. So we get down here. That cookies true bit that I mentioned, we set that up here because uh, we will need to persist cookies across multiple requests. And in the case of Auth0 with Hippo, they actually pass the data a little bit differently depending on whether um, you pass in a phone number or whether you pass in an email address. So we're doing a similar verification here to put that in the right place and making the subsequent request. That request will kick off the MFA um, email sent with the code. And then we provide that uh, request back. Now, you notice I'm not doing try catches in here because at this point, exiting out of the script if there is an error is absolutely fine. In real life, I would want some recovery code here to potentially prompt for the information again if, the, if it wasn't given accurately. And I know in this case that Auth0 is actually pretty good about returning um, 400 class or, or maybe 500 class HTTP codes when uh, something is errored. So I don't have to look somewhere on the page or somewhere in the response payload to figure out whether something's failed. I can just let Guzzle throw an exception for me. So we pass in the code here. We actually keep the username from the previous um, step there, which because we're running this as one run through, we don't have to figure out how to persist that state elsewhere. And then finally, um, there's that OAuth implicit grant uh, that I was kind of alluding to earlier. That's a GET request that uh, will give us back a redirect to some URL. And that redirect, because it's an implicit grant, includes in the hash part of the URL the token information. Now, what that means is if I let the thing redirect, then that information is gone or I would have to reach into Guzzle history and get it, and I don't want to do that. So instead, I provide a parameter on Guzzle saying, please don't redirect me, just give me the response, and I'll pull the location header out of it, which is exactly what I do here. We have parse URL and the lovely, lovely PHP parse underscore stir uh, method that takes an array by reference and populates it. Um, and at the end of that, we have this um, OIDC ID token, which is what we, as it turns out, we need to uh, authenticate to the rest of Hippo's API. No, there isn't a whole lot of consistency here. It could be the access token, could be the ID token, it varies. In this case, it's an OIDC ID token. We figured that out by, again, looking at the requests and seeing the strings matched up. At that point, all we have, once we've logged in, is this single request, and that single request gets us the data that we need. In a lot of cases, you'll have to make more than one request and get more than one blob of JSON and then decide what to do with it, but in this case, it's just the one. So let's actually see this in action. One thing that was surprising to me is that um, they allow folks uh, outside the US to uh, hit this API. Um, I'll show you an example of that not happening in a moment. 
All right, we got the JSON payload back, so we are all good there. That concludes my demos, and we'll get back to standard slides. So, all of these were run as straight through scripts. Um, and that's all well and good, but there were multiple steps where I asked for user input there. In an HTTP sort of case, like uh, for my actual day job, you can't rely on the script continuing running while you're asking a user for input. So what we have done is we'll grab enough state to, um, to keep the request flow going. In this case, it's just uh, cookies plus I think the username and maybe one other thing. And, um, and then we will hydrate that state in in addition to user input when it's time to make the next step in this scraping journey. How you do that winds up being up to you. However, one thing to keep in mind is your state may not just be in cookies. It may be in headers. It may be uh, in lo local storage or session storage to get to those headers, or it may be in some uh, private uh, JavaScript uh, variable somewhere. You'll have to figure that out on your own. This is going to vary from site to site, um, and you'll need a way to persist that so that um, if you're asking for user input or if, for example, they authenticated once and you want to keep that session open, then you will need to um, store enough state to provide back to the server and say, oh yeah, we can pick up where we left off. So if you need to take kind of the other branch in this and actually hit uh, things with a real web browser. There are a couple ways to do it. Some are easier than others, and some are more deprecated and removed than others. W early on, I used PhantomJS with a um, wrapper on top of it called CasperJS to do this when there was when something that was a uh, old CGI script um, that returned weirdly formatted HTML turned into this weird presentation layer JavaScript application that was sending screen coordinates back when you clicked on things. Um, no, you can't make this stuff up. The, so we used PhantomJS for that, and I think that still runs on Phantom because I haven't touched it in years. PhantomJS is uh, really no longer maintained, so don't use that anymore. Start with something that actually uses headless Chrome, which has the side benefit of supporting everything that a standard version of Chromium would. Now, headless Chrome is fine, but you need something to drive it. You can use a tool like Selenium, which has been the industry standard for a while. It's cross-browser compatible, et cetera. Or you can use something that's specific to Chrome called Puppeteer, which allows you a uh, JavaScript interface uh, into the browser. And again, I would say wrap that in a web service. Don't try to run JavaScript in PHP. I'm sure there are a library or two that do run basically the equivalent of Puppeteer in PHP, but I, I wouldn't. Um, so you use Puppeteer. That calls to uh, your Chrome instance and uh, does things. In addition to that, depending on uh, how annoyed your scraping target gets at you scraping, you may need to add in the uh, Puppeteer Stealth uh, module so that you look a little bit more like a real browser. Um, that's what I have experience with. Selenium does exist, but I've never needed it. So, yeah, sometimes sites don't want you to scrape. They will um, block IP addresses. They will block uh, user agents. Of course, user agent is just a header, so that's easy enough to swap. Uh, IP addresses, you may need to run through a proxy network of some sort. Um, browser fingerprinting, trying to catch cases where um, a given browser looks suspiciously the same as either another browser that's been scraping another account from the same IP address, or um, it's like, no, 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 that, that uh, particular browser looks like it is actually um, curl rather than Chrome. So we're just going to block that. Um, there are cases on browser fingerprinting, as mentioned. There's uh, some benchmarking stuff that sometimes goes on. Uh, sometimes you'll see 
uh, the browser trying to do stuff with uh, WebGL. There's a whole bunch of different uh, aspects where somebody can try to fingerprint a browser to see if it's real or not. Uh, it's a bit of a cat and mouse game if you're on the other side of that. Um, and just making sure that I... Um, oh, and, and user activity. Uh, here's another one. You, they'll actually watch uh, mouse movements and mouse clicks. Yes, this does make your browser slow if you're a real user. Um, but they'll try and, and figure out, okay, well, does this look like it's clicking like a bot? So then you build your, um, your own bot tools to behave more like humans. And the, uh, the arms race continues. Um, so this is in addition to visible uh, captures, the annoying, hey, uh, work through this altered warped text. Or in the case of um, Google, it's please train our autonomous vehicles for free. Um, so you have uh, those items, and then uh, if you see the little recapture logo on a page and you don't see that, um, you know, identify whether this corner of a stoplight is a stoplight, then um, what it's doing is usually kind of IP reputation-based stuff plus uh, some browser and user activity fingerprinting. Um, and uh, as one might expect, you can to some extent farm that out um, to places who will basically complete those tasks for you manually. Again, it's, it's a whole bit of an arms race. Um, so some of these tools are written in obfuscated JS to try and prevent you from reverse engineering them and understanding what they are actually supposed to be doing. So one of the anti-bot tool vendors, Shape Security, built a JS unminifier because uh, apparently they like competing with um, other anti-bot vendors and making them look stupid. So you can actually download the Shape Security JS unminifier via NPM, throw a minified, obfuscated um, JS file at it, tell it to basically do its worst, and out comes a more standard looking uh, JS file that you might have a chance of understanding. Um, there are various obfuscation techniques that, that are used. Won't go into them here because in, in general facts, you throw the script into the tool and either it works or it doesn't. At which point you wind up sifting through a few thousand lines of JS to understand what kind of browser fingerprinting is actually being done. So one kind of workaround for some of these activities is there are usually more protections around anti-scraping on people's websites than on the APIs that are used for an app for this or the iOS equivalent. So for example, there is an insurance carrier that has reCAPTCHA on um, on their web portal for logins. Their mobile app does not, at least last I checked, have reCAPTCHA on it. So you use the mobile API and you get information more reliably. Now the catch with that is that that mobile API and that mobile app, um, if they are really specific about security stuff, then they may have added HTTP cert pinning at multiple levels in the application. On Android, that's usually kind of at the top level. On iOS, it may be there, it might not be. Um, on things like bank applications and such, then it's usually there, and you have to kind of pick the application apart to um, be able to intercept that traffic and understand what's going on. So one tool that you can use for iOS in particular for this, um, if they don't have cert pinning at multiple levels, is uh, Charles Proxy. There are cases where um, it will allow you to intercept uh, traffic from a mobile app back to the APIs, and similar to the network pane on Firefox or Chrome, let you understand exactly what is going on back and forth, so you can even potentially mix and match between mobile API endpoints, and at least in some cases, 
their web equivalents. For example, it may be easier to log in and keep a session on mobile, and it may be easier to get additional data on the web UI because you're dealing with a um, full screen on a desktop of clicking through things rather than a five or six inch screen on a, on a mobile device. So, um, now, once you get to the point where you can get the uh, raw data that you need, you may need an additional parsing step if that raw data is not actually in HTML or in JSON or in XML. If you're dealing with Excel documents for some reason, then PHP spreadsheets uh, is a good way of pulling the data out. The catch with this is uh, XLS binary uh, formats, the new 2007 to 365 format. Um, to my knowledge, there is not a PHP library that actually supports that unless PHP spreadsheet added it recently. You'll need to go to some other language like JS to um, to do that extraction rather than trying to write something yourself. Um, alternately, if you have um, encryption on that Excel file, that's also something that isn't, um, at least the new versions of the encryption are not supported by PHP spreadsheet. So rather than going down that rabbit hole, there is a um, Python module that uh, you can pull in. And in the case where I've needed that, you throw the Python module plus like eight lines of code in the Lambda function, you call the Lambda function, it decrypts the uh, Excel file and then you hand that to PHP spreadsheet and you're off to the races. Um, if you're dealing with PDFs, if you're dealing with auto-generated PDFs, chances are that you can use text extraction to get information back from them using things like PDF to text. Um, that is a lot easier and a lot more reliable than going to optical character recognition. But of course only works if you're not dealing with a scan of a copy of a photograph of a PDF that somebody handed in. So in those cases, you may need to uh, go with actual OCR with something like Tesseract, um, potentially export pages of uh, the PDF um, into images. <coughs> and then re-import via Tesseract and um, you know, prepare for you to have higher CPU usage because you're doing you know, some machine learning thing on, um, or rather executing a machine learning model on your OCR document. Um, in addition to this, there may be encryption on PDFs. I say big old air quotes around this because you can still view the PDF, but it pretends that it can't let you copy data from it. Um, there is a utility called QPDF that'll just strip the encryption and then you move on from there. Um, so if you want to do OCR or text extraction on PDFs in an environment that you don't have to set up on your own, again, PDF to text is easy enough. Some of these other utilities are a little bit more finicky. You can use things like, uh, if you want to just use the primitives for it, um, you can use AWS Textract. Um, I believe Google has somewhat of an equivalent. I know that Google was the one who built Tesseract, so I'm sure they have a cloud service for this as well. Um, or at an even higher level, um, significantly more expensive, but there's a uh, company called Sensible that will do data extraction as well for certain document types. So. A couple of different ways to pull information out of documents that are not just HTML or JavaScript or JSON uh, that you may need. With that, um, I will open things up for questions. Thank you so much for your attention, and hopefully some of this information has been useful. Thank you, Ian. That was really great, yeah. Uh, hi, thanks very much for the talk, it was great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just got a quick question about the legal implications of this because you c it's kind of nearly hacking, right? So can people, like, have you ever got into trouble or can people actually try and get you via authorities or anything for any of this so, stuff? That is an excellent question. Um, in terms of my day job, we are operating on behalf of 
the person who holds the insurance policy, for example. So we are merely making it a uh, quicker process for, to get the information that they would normally be able to get manually. Now, insurance companies may not be the happiest about that because in certain cases, uh, whether it's us or a competitor of ours, that insurance information may be used to quote a competitive provider. But at that point, that is a um, business model problem with the insurer. If somebody wants to go somewhere else, it's not a uh, legality problem of, oh, you're not allowed to have access to this data. So obviously, um, you know, make, make sure that what you're doing is not, um, is not illegal. In our case, it's not. Um, and there are cases where if you look at terms of service on, on a site, then they may say, hey, please don't do this. Whether those terms of service have any basis in, uh, in legal fact is a uh, completely different argument than what, it, uh, than what it says on the 10. So there are absolutely cases where like, if, if I was going through a password dump and then just trying to log into people's insurance uh, accounts using those credentials, then uh, yeah, pretty sure that'd be illegal. And we don't do that. <laughs> Anyone else? Mm -hmm. So when someone asks you to, you know, I want this data from this website, is, it, is your first move to, to jump into building the scraping or do you, do you go to them, the, the company or whoever owns that website and say, look, can we get this data from you? Or do you find that that doesn't work and then they're then protective and try and stop you getting the data? So it depends on the site. Uh, in, a, in some cases, of course, there will be um, externally facing APIs where you just, of course, at that point, you use the API. That's the easy way of doing things. Uh, in some cases, you're scraping because there is no API and it's easier for you to build the scraper than for them to build the API. In other cases, uh, they say that, well, that, that sounds nice. We will build an API for you eventually, or we'll add you to our existing API eventually, but um, you need to have enough traffic for that to matter. Um, go ahead and scrape until then. Um, it varies depending on uh, who you're pulling data from. Um, and again, ideally, you work together with whoever the data source is to make sure that things are efficient, as efficient as possible so you aren't hitting their servers uh, hard. And the easiest way of doing that is like, okay, well, yeah, let's make sure that there's API connectivity, at least the easiest way on the consuming side. On the producing side, they may have to build out an API that they don't have. So it varies from case to case. Um, again, for, for, our day, uh, for my day job and for Rob's as well, um, we do have an integration or two that is uh, direct um, kind of trusted with uh, that insurance carrier full on APIs. And that's obviously the preferred way of doing things, but uh, you don't get there in a day. So in a lot of cases, like, well, the APIs don't exist or they're not yet ready for uh, you to go through the effort and them to go through the effort of integration. So you take what, uh, you, take what you can get. Okay, thanks. Uh, actually, as a follow up. Yeah. Uh, and, and more out of interest, have you encountered, um, you know, a site that you, you're just unable to scrape for some reason? Unable to scrape reliably, yes. Um, unable to scrape ever. Um, there, so there is a case that I mentioned earlier in the talk where a site switched from they were actually using ASP.NET Web Forms with all view state madness in there. Um, and you know, that, that was not too terribly difficult once you figured out what was going on. Um, they have since switched to, I, I believe the product is Blazor, B-L-A-Z-O-R. Uh, it's a tool by Microsoft that, I think you do your coding or something in C Sharp on the server side and then it delivers some payloads to the client side. It's not like Angular or whatever. And the data transfer protocol is a modified version of message pack over WebSockets, um, which is about as annoying as it might sound. Eventually, we will uh, we'll reverse that and actually build that out. But um, in terms of uh, low-hanging fruit, that's pretty far up the tree. OK, thanks. Yep. 
Anyone else? I have a question. Yes. Content security policies, shouldn't they prevent that? Scraping? That would assume that you are working within the web browser. Because you are working server to server, you have control to ignore any content security policies that might exist. Um, if there's no browser to look at content security policies, then those headers may as well not exist. So in terms of protecting clients from other malicious like extensions and, and, and such, there is some level of protection that you get kind of client to client. But if you control the client environment entirely, then you can either follow orders or ignore them of any headers that you see. Um, you could add a um, header of uh, do not press F12, uh, and if the browser doesn't uh, support that, then it doesn't matter.